I am Jim Collison, and this is Gallup's Called to Coach, recorded on October 7th, 2022. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love you have you join us in our chat room. If you don't see the chat room, there's a link right above me there. It'll take you to the YouTube instant sign in and join us in chat. Love to know where you're listening from or take your questions later on in the program live. If you're listening after the fact and you have questions, you can always send us an email, coaching at gallop.com. Don't forget to subscribe to Call the Coach on your favorite podcast app or right over there on YouTube so you never miss an episode. Murray Guest is my guest today. He's a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach with eight years of experience, and he shares insights and tips and a bunch of tips today. We're excited to hear those to create more flow in your business. He's one of Australia's leading Gallup Certified Strengths Coaches. Over the past seven years, he's helped over 45 Hundred people unlock and apply their strengths to achieve their professional and personal goals. He partners with leaders to build strengths-based cultures and realize the benefits of a strengths-based approach. And Muzz, always great to have you. Thanks for the extra practice. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. So great to be spending my Friday morning with you. I can think of no better way to finish the week. Um, it's great to be chatting with you. And as always, thank you for the opportunity to connect and have a chat. Muzz, I always enjoy, enjoy our time together, but we want to get to know you a little bit. Maybe not everybody knows you. And so when you meet people or people ask, hey, what do you do? What do you tell them? Give us the short version of that. So the short version is I, I love to work with leaders that want to make a difference, that are focused on developing the engagement of their teams through changing attitudes, developing their leaders and building a strengths-based approach. I work with a whole range of different companies and different industries, so I'm not focused on industry. Um, so currently working with construction, power, finance, pharmaceutical, manufacturing. But for me, it is about the leaders. It's that real connection with a leader that wants to make a difference, whether it's a leader of a team or a CEO of a company. And it links really well to our conversation today about flow. When I reflect back over the last eight years, when I've partnered with a leader and I'm like, they're just doing this because they think it's a good idea or they're ticking the box or it's a bit of training. I realized that wasn't the right choice for me. And it's really those partnerships. And some of my partnerships now be going for three or four years, which I love. We're going to talk about flow here in a second, but I, I want to reflect back on the last couple of years. Um, is we think about, you know, you focus on leaders and managers. It was right before the pandemic, we released It's the Manager. We spent the entire pandemic talking about how to support leaders and managers. Yeah. We produced a new manager report. We have a new leader report that's coming here just in a couple of weeks. How is the state of the leaders you're working with? How is the state of them right now, in your opinion? If you were to kind of give a general, and I'm asking you to be to generalize some things, but yeah, yeah. How's the state of the manager or the managers you're working with? I would say the theme that pops out straight away is uh, burnout, uh, tired, um, sick of online teams and Zoom meetings. Yeah. I've had many managers say, can we just catch up on the phone? Can we just, can we get back to meeting face to face? Um, and I feel like there's a lot of those themes because of the busyness and the juggling of, are we restricted? Are we not? Can we go out? Can we not? Are we working from home? Are we not? And we've still got to deliver on projects. And so I feel like there's that theme. And then what the best managers are doing is having those conversations around what does it really mean for us right now? What are the priorities and, and what's not? And I still remember one of the leaders I worked with uh, a year ago when we were running a workshop and uh, well, at, towards the back end, we're talking about what does success look like for the upcoming 12 months? And I said, okay, and what's a stretch goal? And she stopped me. And she said, Murray, actually, I don't care about stretch goals right now. All I care about is that my people are well and safe. And let's just focus on that. Mm. And, and they're the type of leaders I love to work with because it is just remembering we're actually talking about humans, talking about people that have got a lot to deal with right now. So I feel like the best leaders are doing that and they're remembering that with, unfortunately, this theme of we've just been so busy juggling so many 
needs, whether that's personally and professionally. Yeah. It, you, you mentioned the burnout and I almost feel like we need a collective vacation. Like everybody needs <laughs> to go on vacation at the same time. Cause you can't, we, we came back to an environment, w- whether you, you know, whether you had to go stay at home or whether you continue to work yeah. on site in, and we all kind of came back and, um, you know, I, I know a lot of folks who've spent some time away over the last couple months, whatever that is, you summer here in the United States, winter down there in Australia. But it, it, it feels like the, the pace has picked up for everybody. I hear across the board, just like, oh my gosh, this is, it's unbelievable how busy I am right in this space. And so I, it would be nice if we could just all collectively stop, stop for a second, take a two week vacation for everybody. Cause it's hard to get, you know, you go away and you feel back. What kind of advice are you giving to leaders and managers who are in that area of, of burnout and are thinking like, how do they get their well-being back on track? What kind of, what are you finding is working knowing we can't just all take a collective two week vacation? Yeah. So um, I, I love the concept uh, obviously that um, Jim Clifton talks about uh, around filling your bucket and the book, fill your bucket and putting drops in your bucket. And we can get those drops from other people, but also how are you filling up your own bucket? And I think it's getting clear around the little things that are powerful for you and impactful for you in filling your own bucket. And what I know has worked for me in running my business and what I talk to managers about is don't wait for the two weeks. I even had someone the other day, Jim, say, oh, you know what? I can't wait till January when I take three weeks off. And I'm like, well, what are you doing between now and then? And it's, I think it's all those little things we can do along the way, which is, do, can you finish work a bit earlier today? Can you walk the dog in the morning? Can you um, make sure you get to that, that class and hang out with those people that are important to you, those social connections? And so I believe it's all the little things that add up. Um, and I think also for managers, it's that realization that it is different for each person. And so it's not the great resignation. It's the great realignment about realigning what's important for you and for the people you lead and then sorting that out. I think it's good to lead by example. And, uh, and and a lot of our coaches that are out there, you have to lead in that way. We want to spend a little time in the title of this, had this idea of flow, right. In getting into flow. And of course, I think flow is also kind of a, a key to this a burnout concept. It's it's life's a little bit easier when you're in flow when you're working in flow. So before we start with that concept, what is flow? When you say that, Muzz, what do you mean by uh, by having business flow? Yeah, so I'm certainly not the expert in flow, but I know um, how important it is for me. And if I think about the times over the last eight years when I've been in flow and what that's meant for me and my energy and uh, my success, and when I haven't been in it, and I actually feel like when I haven't, I've been an employee to myself. It's like Murray Guest working for Murray Guest. I'm like, hang on, I thought I was the boss. What's going on? No, I've got to go and do this thing versus I have the choice to go and do it. And so that's when I'm not. But the flow state is definitely described as a feeling where under the right conditions, you're fully immersed in whatever you're doing. You're energized. uh, You instinctively know what to do next. You can't wait to do it. You're getting to use your strengths. You feel like you're at your best. Um, And for me, I feel like it's about how do we create more of that as coaches Mm. and as, as people in our lives, because that's infectious for not just us, but those people around us. And I, I love uh, the continual focus that it brings in my life when I think about what does that look like? How do I keep doing that and, and bringing that, that flow state and, and really being in the zone? For, for coaches, and I, I want to talk to coaches about this in this in kind of in this topic. And it's great to kind of think about how as coaches we can help our leaders, but I think we can't take people places we haven't been before. So let's think about flow for coaches what could that look like for them or what kind of advice would you, for everybody, it's a little bit different, right? So thinking about what are the things they might want to be looking for to see what are the things that put me in that flow state? Well, one of the things which uh, I got introduced to back when I was a manager in my life before running this business, and it was taking time out to review myself as a leader on a weekly basis. 
And it was so powerful. And I share it with a lot of the managers I work with, which is take time out and think about what's working, what's not. When are you in that state of flow in this past week? What can you learn from that? Apply it to the following week. I even build on that now as I have over the past eight years. When am I getting to use my strengths and how can I aim them in the coming week? And so I'd say the first thing is the self-awareness. And so as a, as a coach, take that time out on a weekly basis like a football team does. Not that mine's winning at the moment, Jim. I, I hope yours is going well. <laughs> we're, we're doing okay. We're, oh, we, we call it soccer, but okay, keep going. <laughs> But, but taking out that time on a weekly basis like a high-performing team should and treat yourself like that high-performing team in that reflection and then uh, planning forward around what was that week like, when was I in flow, when was I not, and then how do I apply that to the following week. So without that self-awareness and that review, you just don't know. So that's the first thing. I think you've got to build that awareness. And as we know, it's going to be unique for each person. So that's the, the first thing. And the second thing is um, I would actually say be strengths-based in your approach as a coach. Mm. I've heard lots of coaches talk about uh, I'm doing my bookkeeping, I'm doing my finance, I'm doing my website, and then I'm doing this, and then I'm doing that. And um, I, I'm not saying don't do all that if you love do it and you get in the zone doing that. However, Let's be honest, that is not a true strengths-based approach. Where do your strengths lie? Where do your skills lie? And how can you really uh, be a bit more, honestly, a bit more, uh, let's say, brutal about that and saying, right, I'm good at this. I'm going to focus on that. And who can I partner with? Who can help me to do those other things? Mm -hmm. And it's some of the biggest shifts that have helped me to then make sure I'm creating more of that time to get in that flow state. Mm -hmm. Catherine in the chat says, uh, today I uh, felt flow first time in a long time. Protecting my calendar was a great way to give myself some time, like what you just said, Muzz, to think uh, and honor my achiever um, for that. Let's think for you then. Can you give me for, for you some examples? Like, how do you know when you're in flow? Yeah, so I would say, so I have responsibility number five. And uh, when I look at my to-do list and I'm inspired by my to-do list, so for that responsibility, that psychological ownership and that integrity of doing what I say I will, if I look at my to-do list for the clients I'm working with and I'm like, yes, I'm so glad I'm doing that. Yes, I want to tick that off. Yes, that's, that's, I want to do more of that. Now I'm in the flow state. If I look at my to-do list, I'm like, oh, why am I doing that? How, why did I say yes to that? And and, and, oh, my God, I forgot to do that as well. That is a great indicator for me. Am I in that, that flow state? Mm -hmm. The other, if we go to the very top, relate to number one, which is the best strength in the world, let's be honest. <laughs> um, uh, those could be fighting words because, you know, yeah, I think yeah. woo is the best. <laughs> <laughs> but for, and in all seriousness, my relator, if I don't feel like I've got that relator being met with the clients I'm working with, if I don't have that connection, if I don't feel like we're, we're on the same page, we've got that trusted, deep connection, uh, that's, that's a bit of a flag for me. Like, hang on, this is not the right fit. So it's then for me, looking at the relationships and the work I'm doing, that's a great indicator of if I'm in that flow state or not. Mm. I had an experience this weekend where I redid, so Ranger Maximizer kind of activator on the fly, I redid have a whole like computer area that's got all my computers and stuff. And I kind of, I just tore it down and put it all back together. As a kid, I used to do this. I'd tear apart my room to clean it up. I'd tear it apart and then put it back together. I love to rearrange, organize. Yeah. And for me, it's not an, it's not a discipline. It's a potential. It's what things could be potentially in the new setup. I get excited. I get, I can feel myself getting excited about future potential of things. Now, I rarely actually get it there, but the process for me of getting of getting it there is the flow. Hours flew by. I was like, oh, man, I got to go. Shoot, I wish I had more time to get. And then I remember at one point during the weekend, I just came down there and I just stared at it. And just staring at what I had done kind of put me back in that flow state, kind of put me, mm. made me feel, just gave me this incredible feeling of satisfaction. And maybe that's a, 
word I've never really thought about in a flow state, but maybe deep satisfaction is one of those things. Can you, Murray, res respond to that? Any, any thoughts uh, about finding that satisfaction of being an indicator of flow? I, I love that. So I think there's something about those two words together, deep satisfaction. Mm. And when I, in my reflection of, again, as a coach and a facilitator working with leaders and teams, and I think about the work of the partnership and what we've covered in that partnership, whether it's an online session or face-to-face -face or coaching, because it's a, a program that covers all those, do I feel that deep satisfaction in what we're doing or do I feel like it was just a, a, a bit of training, for example? And so for me, if, because I, I feel like uh, the whole idea of called to coach, Jim, it wasn't like, hey, I became a coach. It was like, oh, I'm just validating what I was all along anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so therefore that deep satisfaction really uh, comes when I'm like, okay, we got to the place we wanted to get to and it was a true partnership. And yeah. so then um, I then leave the session or leave the, the program, whatever uh, length it was, with more energy than when I started it. And so then that gives me more energy to then do more of that. And so I say that's where that real deep satisfaction comes from. I'll give a quick example. So I ran a program, a two-day leadership program recently for a client. And I get this phone call three days later and I didn't recognize the number. And I, I answered that. And this gentleman said, oh, I just wanted to call you, Murray, because I just had this realization. And he told me his name and I had to, I said, okay, I'm trying to remember which one it was. There was 24 people in this program. And he then says, I just want to let you know that we covered a lot. I don't remember a lot of it, but what I do remember, I went, oh, okay, where's this going? <laughs> and, and then he says, I realized when I got home, I was having a conversation with my 10-year-old son and I've been blaming him for our relationship and realized it was all my fault. Mm. Mm. And how I've been showing up for him in these conversations, I haven't been curious. I've been asking questions. I wasn't thinking about what I was bringing. And I realized if I just changed that, we'd have a better relationship. Mm. Mm. And so I was getting this at four o'clock mm -hmm. on a Friday and I mm -hmm. thought, you know, that that's what it's all about. Yeah. If, if this yeah. participant is now thinking about how he's going to show up as a better parent, not yeah. just as a better leader in his team, I went, wow, that that's just made my day. And so then I got that deep satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That hard. Like you're like, Oh, it's Friday. <laughs> Like, you know, it's, I, can it be Monday? Like, can we, can, we, can we, can we do this again? You know, to can, get, can to you get ring me back and, again next Monday? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could just call me and, you know, I often get into flow during call to coach. Like it's been one of the yeah. secrets of this is we get, you know, we get going and I look at the clock and I'm like, oh no, like we haven't covered, you know, what I wanted to cover or whatever. And it is, it's been interesting. I just got some feedback today from one of our, uh, from, from one of, um, folks at Gallup, I'd gone in and she said, you know, I listen to called to coach, uh, every morning on the way in. She's, you know, one of our sales um, folks. Mm -hmm. And, and she, then she said, and then one time you said, and it was like one of those moments you're like, oh my God, they're actually listening. Like, this <laughs> is kind of, this is kind of scary. You know, um, Steve, Steve brings up an interesting point. He says, I love it when my clients are also in flow with me, our sessions fly by seemingly in the blink of an eye how important is it that that especially in the coaching that 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 flow may come at the same time have you had that experience and any thoughts on that uh, i love steve's uh comment and i totally am in line with that and i'm thinking about the the analogy here of uh you know rivers combining you know integrating flowing side by side and then they flow together and if we've, we're working with clients and they're in that flow state through change, through their own cultural journey, and they're energized, um, I, I totally am in line with Steve on that. And I feel that because then you, you feel that and it's infectious. So we're working together. It's a real partnership. And for me, um, that's where a lot of uh, the programs I run, there's a, a real 
focus on the foundations at the start around our attitudes. And so what's the attitudes we're bringing to the work we do? Because if we're not focusing on that and then we just jump into, hey, what are your strengths and, and get to know those and why strengths? But let's actually talk about how we're showing up day in, day out to then create that foundation. So let's have an honest conversation for a second around this. Can you be like, oftentimes we, we often say it's hard to be an engaged employee when you're suffering in some way. And, and that can be, there's a variety of ways of where that suffering can, can you find flow when you're in the same state? If you're in a suffering state in some way, whether that be in any of the elements of well being, so to speak, can that affect flow? And if, if we're there, you know, can that stop it from happening? Do you think? Uh, so first thing to say is I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> Did you stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night? No, it's okay. You can you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not a psychologist, and uh, but I love um, understanding and working with people. Mm -hmm. And so from my experience around this is um, – the suffering could come from a whole range of areas. And, and yes, there's people that are, are parts of cultures or working for leaders where they don't feel the, the opportunity to get into flow because of the environment, the culture, the relationship with their manager. And we know how important that is. So for me, it is then helping that person focus back on what's in their control. Because quite often we're focusing or that person's focusing on what's out of their control and, and, you know, below the line, all of that blame and identifying what they can't do versus what can I do and, and what's uh, in my control that I could then take action on. And, and again, the little shifts, the small one degree shifts that make a huge difference and they all add up. Uh, and the analogy I've used a, a stack of times, Jim, is if we're in Sydney, you and I, and we're going to fly to LAX and the pilot takes off, but every hour he just shifts that little bit a little bit of a one degree shift, we're going to land somewhere completely different. And so those one degree shifts around, well, what can I do then, which land me in a different place, whether that's in that culture where I don't feel engaged and I'm suffering or the one degree shifts that I can do as a coach, which land me in a different place all add up. That said, I've also had some very brutal conversations with some people I've been coaching where it's like, you've got three choices. You either need to have a conversation with your manager and sort this out. You need to um, live with it as it is, or you need to leave. Mm -hmm. So which path are you going to go down? Oh, I don't want to leave. Okay. Well, then um, oh, I don't want to do nothing. Okay. So what's a conversation you need to have with your manager around the, the challenges you've got and how you're going to move that forward? Mm. I think that's, that's really good advice. We often say uh, for managers, ask, you know, it's their managing folks, ask them what's the best rec recognition you've ever had. Marina kind of has a spin on that with flow. She says, I feel that for every client, there's something else that gets them into in the flow mode. And this is one of the things uh, I explore and tune myself in our first sessions. Is that a question? Do you ask that early? Do you, do you, do you spend some time? Talk a little bit about that. So fun fact, Jim. I asked that question and one of the photos I have on the slide in my presentation is me presenting at the Clifton Strength Summit. You know when we used to do that face-to-face, -face, that thing? In, in person, you mean? In, per yes, did we person. ever do it in person? I can't remember that far back. We did for four years, Jim. <laughs> um, but honestly, I, I use a photo of me presenting at one of the breakout sessions in the summit and I say, hey, this is me when I'm in flow. Mm -hmm. and, and I frame it up saying, yes, I get nervous. And yes, I get worried because it's important to me, but also I know when I'm doing it, it is just I'm the time's flying by, I'm energized, I'm connecting, I'm doing what I was meant to do. And here's my example. And then I get people to explore what's their example in their workplace, in their life. And then we link to, well, what strengths do you think are at play in your, your dominant talents? And that then generates some really good connection back to how we can be at our best going forward. Do you think imposter syndrome can play in? I find sometimes when I get into flow and I'm real, I mean, I'm just really feeling it. It feels good. I'm going with it. When that, when that time is over and I'm kind of coming back, I kind of look back at flow self and I'm like, that wasn't me. What, why did I do it that way? Why, you know, do, do, do you ever find, or do you ever get any feedback from clients that there's a little bit of maybe that imposter syndrome after a heavy moment of, of, being in that flow 
Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about the, the notion of healthy imposter syndrome. Mm. Of there's that, yes, I was in flow and how was that perceived or how was I showing up and was I still being genuinely myself? And unfortunately, a lot of people and uh, managers feel that I'm now in a manager position and should I be here? Is this, am I ready for this? Do I bring what this role needs? And I don't feel like I, I own my seat at the table. And so, yeah, turning that around to actually say, well, how, how do you, why do you, why, why is this, uh, you know, a part of your leadership journey that you definitely deserve? And let's explore that. But yeah, I, I've had some of those conversations. I think I would say it's more in the one-on-one -on -one sessions versus a, a group coaching session. Yeah, the, I, I think it's in a spot where you could be a little more more vulnerable. You yeah. know, yeah. Steve says he's had a lot of experience with clients feeling some imposter syndrome in the past couple of years. It usually occurs when they become disconnected from their strength zone. But I like the spin on it. Like I like the spin you put on it, where it's like there may be a positive reflection on that zone moment. You did some incredible things in it. And that may actually be an indicator that you were in flow. Like if you're feeling those like, whoa, what was that all about? Having that thought may be an indicator that you were in a moment, you know, you were in yeah. one of those moments, right? I, I, so I um, definitely uh, link to what Steve's saying, but thanks, Jim, for your comment, because I feel like any time that we can reflect back and we can own what went well as a strengths-based yeah. approach, but also own those areas where we can do things better. We show up more authentically. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when our strengths may have been a bit raw, getting in the way, you know, they can show up as well in, this, in that flow state, unfortunately. But yeah, let, let's, let's actually, let's link back to my point at the start about those review points in our life. Because and how powerful they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just remember I've had some really amazing moments where I know I've been in flow and I come out of them and I'm a little, it's a little disconcerting. I feel a little like, and maybe that's just an overwhelming feeling being in that moment. And how I reflect on that makes as much of a difference of how I view that experience as uh, as anything if i come out of i can think about it very negatively or i can come out of very positively and i think maybe i've had more success in the last four or five years coming out of that positively yeah say yeah. no 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 no. i did do that that was okay that was pretty cool no i did have an impact right thinking yeah. through all those things right yeah so um any other <laughs> any other as we think about flow and what you the way people work in their business in that way, how can they turn that into success or what kind of advice would you have on turning some of that into success in their business or helping them with their business? So a lot of clients that I've worked with, I'd say it's a very common theme, Jim, is the lack of clarity and the impact that makes. And that lack of clarity causes a whole range of emotions from frustration uh, stress, anguish, anger even, and then, of course, the the output of not being aligned, misaligned, um, needing rework, um, and a whole range of things. And so what I have, have definitely embraced more and more over the last eight years is where am I getting clarity in my own life and the way I'm running my business and, and how that looks um, for me personally is uh, a weekly meeting with my wife. And um, sometimes that's playing backgammon and I lose every time and that's okay. <laughs> She's very good. And we're, but, but we're chatting or it's uh, uh, during the, um, the week, whenever it might be. But for us, it's definitely about just like a client, a team, a manager has regular meetings with a team. Let's have that regular meeting as a family. And in that meeting, let's get clear about what I'm doing, what's coming up, what's my wife doing, what are the kids doing? And to quote Jim Krieger, ex-CFO of Gallup, we talked about this, Jim. Um, it's all about thinking beyond Friday night. Don't just think, oh, what have we got this week or, or what are we doing on Friday night? What are we doing for dinner? But where am I traveling? Who needs the quiet time in the house because, you know, they're doing something online or, hey, you need to be off the Wi-Fi. 
because as much as the Wi-Fi is good, it can still get stressed. Or if we're traveling and there's kids, but that clarity, let's just get really clear. And I mean, uh, the quote from Brene Brown comes to mind, which is clarity is kindness. Mm. So let's get clear on that, where are we going, which then enables the flow. Because without that, it gets bumpy and messy and and, and Jim, I'm going to say I'm far from perfect on this. We just had to recently reschedule an appointment for one of the kids because my wife's like, I'm here. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going there. Hang on a minute. We booked this appointment. And I'm like, oh, that's right. We didn't quite cover that in our, mm-hmm. our catch up. Mm-hmm. But that clarity is super, super important. Yeah. And, and I really agree with you. You know, our Q1 question or Q12 assessment, Q1, I know it's expected of me. And I, and I, that, that has such a universal, I think, it, both understanding going into a role, going into a, maybe into your business as a coach. And I, I think some young, young, not in age, but young and just starting. Yeah. They need to ask them their selves the questions. Do I, as a coach, do I know what's expected of me in this? Yeah. I think they get all hyped up about doing the job, but, but thinking through the expectations, getting clarity what have you learned in that? Like what kinds of questions should you be asking yourself about getting clarity around your expectations and that you kind of, you mentioned that communication with your spouse, right? Your yeah, partner. Yeah. What else have you learned? What, what other areas do you think you can get clarity on or you can get those expectations set around? Yeah. And sorry, good point. Tammy is my wife. I, I didn't mention <laughs> important, important bit of data there. I know it's good. Um, well, I think one is the, like I mentioned, the the travel. Uh, I would say secondly is uh, planning out those um, events that we've got coming up. I would say also um, when our energy is going to be up or down. Uh, another one is when do you have the energy for you typically during the day for the deep thinking and the shallow thinking? Mm. And this is something which I have learned for me. Definitely it's more in the morning for that deep thinking, whereas end of the day at night time, don't come to me to solve a problem or do a number crunch something on Excel because I just don't have that mental capacity. It's just not the way my body works. And I think getting clarity about what that looks for you and also for the managers you work with Mm. and for your, your partner and then where's that energy lie best for you during the day and then how do you uh, work with each other on that? Mm. Um, the next one I would say is around this clarity piece is um, getting really clear about what you're getting. Honestly, Jim, what you're getting paid to do with your clients. What is that partnership? What is it about? And um, quite often on projects within organizations, they talk about scope creep. It's like, oh, we're going to do this in this project and now it's this and this and this and it's getting bigger and it can happen to us as coaches. And I think early on in my excitement to do some work with a client, I say, yes, yes, yes. But I wasn't clear on what that yes, yes, yes look like. But getting really clear around, well, what are we trying to achieve? What are those outcomes? What has the team done before? What other development have they recently done? And then also, um, let's get really clear on those outcomes over this program mm-hmm. and, and check in on that. So there's a couple of things there. I love the the expectations back to the customer in some ways of, of yeah. saying, now, let's be really clear about what, what what are we looking for here? Where are we looking to go? What are we looking to do? What's, what's, a, what, what's an acceptable outcome? I think sometimes you're right. We get started on these things and is a, is a, you know, as a young student and even in my early twenties, uh, high activator, high maximizer, you know, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. <laughs> I would just get started. Like somebody, Hey, let's okay. Ooh, shoot out the door. Like, and they're like, where are you going? <laughs> like, you don't even know where you're going yet. And I'm like, I know, but I'm excited about it. Right. And I think, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to, um, talk down any of that excitement because we need yeah. some of that. Right. But getting the opportunity, like you say, to get some clarity on that, to kind of think like, and I think getting those expectations back, what's a win? Like what's, what's satisfaction for you? What helps you in this? I don't know if we ask enough of those questions as you're thinking about your clients. Do you ask, do you try to front load this with some of those questions just so you're clear? 
Yeah, definitely. Front load them. And so whether that's through a short online survey or a conversation or a combination of both, uh, the other step in the process is I, I often get the team members to complete a short online survey. So we're getting the manager's perspective, but also the team member's perspective. The other thing is definitely getting the managers to complete their strengths early in the process because then I'm getting an understanding about where they're seeing the world and their team and what's going on for them through a lens of their own strengths and how they're showing up. And I think when I've done that partnership really well, it's like, ah, oh, so my relators are seeing this or some of my top strengths are seeing it this way and now I can see where yours are showing up and, and, and where they're being met or not met and, and that lens that that's bringing as well. And back on the spouse thing, and and because a lot of coaches, let's be honest, are sol- solo entrepreneurs running the business from home, knowing the strengths of your spouse, if you have one, your partner, is super, super important as well. So then you know how those two are working together. And the reason I say that, Jim, is because my wife has activated at the top and you just sounded like her. She's She's <laughs> great. <laughs> Oh, uh, the curse, the, the activator curse. Yes, it, 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 it does happen. Um, Muzz, you said something that reminded me, you know, we, we often talk to our kind of our solopreneur coaches, but well over half of our certified coaches are embedded in organizations. Yeah. And if we, if we say we had an embedded and we do, we have embedded coaches that are listening to this who don't have to worry about the business side of things. But if you think about coaching them and they're coaching in an org, in an organization, what does that mean for them? And what is what could that flow be like? Or what kind of advice might you give to them around this topic inside the organization? They're not worried about the business end of things. It's all taken care of. But yeah. working with people, what kind of advice would you, would you have for them? Uh, so the first thing that pops in the head in my head is that your strengths journey is ongoing. And so as a strengths coach, and you're working with people, helping them understand their strengths within your organization, you're on an ongoing journey for yourself as well. So how are your strengths showing up, continuing to understand what, uh, they're looking like, how they're helping you, how they're helping, uh, hindering you at different times. And then, Um, that continual reflection to then, you know, continue to honestly claim and aim those strengths as you go along. I would say that's a key thing. I think the second one would be, again, that clarity piece with anyone that you're helping, whether that's group coaching or um, a one-on-one coaching within the organization, to get really clear about what you're trying to achieve Mm -hmm. and what that looks like. And you can always revisit that as you go along. But again, create that space for that conversation. And the way I framed this up in the past is have the conversation before you need to have the conversation. Mm. Mm. And quite often when we get to the, to the place of, oh, I thought you were doing this. I thought this was what was going to happen. I thought these were the outcomes. And we've got the emotions are starting to kick in and a bit of the fight or flight might be happening. We want to have that conversation earlier to prevent, you know, getting to a place of, you know, high emotion and someone saying something which is maybe not the way they wanted it to come out. So let's have the conversation before we need to. And what does that look like? Let's get clear about what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to work together and do that. And my third part here, Jim, would be, again, your own energy management. So coaching can drain a lot of people. It does drain me, definitely, um, a lot of the times. And so be clear around when you're setting up that coaching within the organization, giving yourself some time to recharge, to refresh, uh, early on, Jim, I was doing back-to-back coaching with no breaks, and then I wondered why I was falling asleep at four o'clock in the afternoon. Like, so definitely, as an internal coach, consider how you are giving yourself that time to refill your bucket, refill your um, energy levels between, and and making sure that you are um, creating that space. And I guess the fourth one. Now you've got me thinking. <laughs> is um, quite often I think as coaches and wanting to serve others, and maybe this is my high responsibility at times, is we can feel like we're the ones driving the process, you know, taking all the notes, driving the ownership and doing that. But actually we, we need people that we're coaching, whether it's a, a manager leading a team or someone one-on-one, for them to own their own development 
mm-hmm. and to be driving it. So again, be clear about well, what, what am I going to bring to that partnership and what are you doing? Let's get really clear on that. And that could come down to notes from the coaching session or follow-up information or booking sessions. But let's just get really clear on that to make it easier and get into that flow. I think some internal coaches, it's not their only responsibility to coach. Yeah, they're all yep. right. They're also doing another job on top of it, which they have to balance. Um, I think I, I loved your advice. You know, the the pressure is a little bit different and the clarity. We we have I've heard this a lot in the Facebook groups that folks folks pre pandemic they were wanting of this strengths culture, uh, strengths based culture to begin. Yeah. We went through the pandemic. Leadership is now seeing the destruction that took place. And they remember, oh, there was this person who before the pandemic was talking about strengths. We need a strengths initiative. And they come to those people and say, I want everybody in the company strengths today. Right? Yeah, they, yeah. They, there's this we need a done today kind of thing. What, it, what would you be for, for a coach like that? What would be your advice as you think about like, now it's too, it might be too much of a good thing all at once. Any, any thoughts on that? We want it all right now. Type deal. Yeah. Well, I, I totally get that. I mean, in my previous role as an L and D manager of a large site, I, I experienced that. So I think you, you raised an important point that I think we can't skip though, Jim, is when your role as a coach is part of another role that you've got. I think, again, the conversations with your manager around how do I fit this in, what does that look like, that it's not just something that I'm adding on to my business as usual work, I think is really important. Because I have, unfortunately, and I'm sure you have, Jim, where it's like I've got to deliver on these projects and this business as usual and I'm trying to squeeze in being a coach. Mm-hmm. So let's get clear with your manager and how does that work around what I do need to deliver and how can I be a coach that's supporting the business? So I think that's really, really important. And then when we've got someone that's full of passion and we want to roll out strengths to everyone, let's get a, a clear project plan in place like we would with any other project we're doing in the business. Who's doing what, doing when, what does success look like? And then how do we um, create some momentum and do it as you would at any other project. If you're rolling out a new ERP system or doing some other cultural change, whatever it might be, treat it like a proper project. Don't just treat it like, oh, one person can go and do that because you wouldn't do that if you're rolling out uh, some new, new, new process or system. And so get clear on the project and get the people on board. And then the second one is make sure you have the leadership support from the top. Mm-hmm. Um I had a client recently that wanted to do some leadership training and we went through what the culture's like. And honestly, Jim, I was getting some some flags that said, we need to do some work with the leadership team and we need to make sure they're on board before we go ahead with this. And I was very clear. And that hasn't progressed because I don't think that client wants to do that. Mm. And so to be honest, if we're not got that alignment around what are we trying to achieve with the, the leaders and the managers, and it's been cascaded down and it's you trying to push it from the side, it will never get there. So again, let's make sure we've got that cascading, you know, we're speaking the language. This is important, getting people involved from the top. Justin says, uh, totally critical without top leadership endorsement. It's a tough haul for sure. We yeah. er, early in the pandemic, we spent a lot of time talking about building strengths-based cultures and one of those steps is ex- executive leadership sponsorship in, yep, in, yep. in an org. And I, and I love, <clears throat> I love the accountability you put back. It, so an organization comes and says, we want to be strength space. And you're like, okay, the leaders need to do it first. And then if, like, if you get pushback at that point, no matter what you do downstream, you're going to fight it. You, chances are you may be fighting it the whole way. I love, do, do you kind of see that as like a little litmus test to, to be like, hey, if the leadership's not willing to do it, is that kind of what you're looking for? Um, I would say it's uh, honestly a multifaceted thing. Um, yeah. and, and what I mean by that is uh, it could be a situation where there's one manager that wants to uh, introduce strengths to a team and this is an opportunity to introduce it to the rest of the business. And once that happens, there's going to be a flow on effect. Mm. and the rest of the managers can see that. Um, so that may be an option. But if I feel like there's no manager support at all, 
well then, uh, yeah, to be honest, at my best, I would say, no, Jim, let's not go ahead. Early on in, in the business eight years ago, I think when I wasn't so uh, structured and confident in that approach, I might have said, and I did say yes to some things. And I was like, ah, I shouldn't have because they didn't have that sponsorship. Yeah. Mm. A couple of good comments coming in and some questions. Let's, let's cover those here. Uh, um, Tish says, I realized early on, that I needed to put 30 minutes on my calendar in between coaching calls uh, just to give you a chance to come back and get some natural energy and some other things like lunch or bathroom breaks. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think we think we can stack those up and we have good intention of ending a call 10 minutes early, but you know that doesn't work, right? You've got Yeah. To, yeah. I, I just want to jump on this one too, Jim. And it's, it's whether you're uh, an employee in an organization or you're a coach running your business and you are working from home, the the build on this energy management and the space is also how you're using the energy of your home. And what I mean by that is uh, I've heard of lots of people that are like, I've set up my home office and that's where I work and and I feel like I'm I'm honestly trapped in a prison because that's my space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I and and then I've heard other people say uh, the space works for me. So it's again, it's individual. Here's what I know works for me and for other people that I've talked to is when I say use the energy of your home, I have uh, an office I'm in right now, which is the, this is my office, get stuff done, be present. Then I know if I want to be a bit more creative, I'll sit somewhere else. I'll sit out towards the back of the house. And then if I'm actually doing some work, that's a bit, you know, a bit uh, shallow, a bit more of that, just processing things. I might sit at the dining table. Mm. And then if there's a coaching client that I want to have a different type of conversation with, honestly, I'll sit up in the corner of the bedroom, shut the door, and I can be really, really present. Um, or if it's a, it's a, just more of that check-in with a, a client, I might just go out the front and pull some weeds out of the garden and have a chat on the phone. And so I think it's a really powerful thing to think about where you might sit, no matter how big or small your place yeah. is, that's going to really support what you're trying to achieve and support your your energy. I love that. This is going to sound crazy, but at the very beginning of the pandemic, this direction that I'm talking to you right now, this is the webcast direction. This is when I'm podcasting, I go this direction. The work laptop is sitting over here to my right. For those that are on audio, it's over here to my right. I have a camera for that as well. I could do work this way, but I I needed to separate the two out. Yeah. Powerful. I, I go this way. I go 90 or 45 degrees different, 90 degrees different. And, um, angles were a challenge for me in school. And so 90 (laughs) degrees different. And it, it changes, it changes my mind a little bit, right? It's like, nope, I'm taking work calls on this side. And when I'm webcasting, I'm taking them in this direction. My chair literally, it just doesn't move, but it's the, it's a different, it's a, it's a different angle. It's a different location. It's a different point of view, I guess, is what you're saying, right? Yeah, so you change the environment and it influences your your mindset and your approach. And just like we know, uh, we can walk into one office and go, oh, this is great. I feel energized and inspired. And another office where you might walk in and go, oh, this doesn't inspire me. I feel a bit drained. And it's the same for our home spaces as well. And the subtleties and those changes, like you're saying, Jim, are really powerful. Um, and I actually invite everyone to look at that, whether you're, a coach within an organization or a coach from home because a lot of people still in doing hybrid working at home. Just get a feel for that and what that looks like for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, now that we've added um, going, going back into the office, into that equation, I, I've done something similar now with the office. I had certain things I'll do in my office, certain things I want to do in the studio. And so, and then, so I have four different locations, right? I have home, these two, in the office, in the studio, in the office, or in my office, um, and I love that. I, ne- I, ne- I never th- until you talked about this. I never thought about the different energies that those yeah. brought. It just naturally happened that way. But it's right. I gravitated towards them because I was getting different feel. I was getting different energy. You know, I just I, I just pictured you at a at a board table, and we're all sitting around having a meeting. Yeah. And then you're working on something and then a decision needs to be made. And you say to everyone, oh, hang on, we need to all turn 90 degrees now. <laughs> Just turn. <laughs> and have a different conversation. 
<laughs> it's it maybe it's a little bit like that. It's just it's change it changes your mind a little bit. Um, I don't want to miss this question. Rebecca had asked. Yeah. When people are burned out, they often feel like there's a big gap from burnout to flow. Have you seen clients who are in burnout also manage to get into flow? And um, how can this gap best be navigated? Ah, oh, it's it's a a big question, Rebecca. And thank you. I, I think unfortunately, yes, I've seen it and I felt it myself. Um, I would say the first thing is, again, I'm not a psychologist and as coaches, we're not, um, often, um, majority of the time. And if someone's really burnt out, do they need to get some support from somewhere else? And so that could be using a company EAP or seeing a health professional. So I'd say that's sometimes, uh, something we explore. The second thing is again, look at your strengths. I'm a big believer of if we're getting to use our strengths somewhere in our life, it's filling up that NG, filling up the bucket. Um, the third thing is those one percent, as we talked about before. Where's some of those small shifts that someone can make to help start to rebuild that energy and and start to do that? And it could be, uh, like we said very early on, Jim, about don't wait a month to take two weeks off. Can you take a day off and? Uh, and spend some time doing what will refill your energy in your cup and to rebuild that. Um, that the last piece, which has been ver- really valuable for me over the last eight years uh, and also for people to work with around that shift in gratitude. And so that mindset that comes when we've got a, a, a gratitude approach to our life, and I would even say, uh, leveling your gratitude expectation, lo- sorry, lowering your gratitude expectation. So I'm really grateful for the smallest things, which then creates this gratitude mindset, which then you really appreciate what's around you, which starts to change how you think about what's going on in your, in your life. Yeah. I love that. That gratitude like recognition has a way of creeping its way into the way you feel. Yeah. And, yeah. Right. And, you know, you're having a bad day or whatever, and you're like, ah, oh, could I be grateful for something? I know that sounds weird, but it is one of those things that you begin and it begins to, it begins to work its way through your system. You're like, Oh, maybe there's some other things I can be kind of grateful for. One of, one of the other things that's been helpful to me during this crazy last couple of years is this idea of a reboot. Mm-hmm. And when things just aren't working, I'm like, I'm just going to reboot that whole thing. Like it's <laughs> let's just, and I think sometimes we thought that was a failure and we like, we quit. Right. Like, and so instead of quitting, Nah, just let's just do a reboot. Like, yep. I I, I want to keep doing it, but I've got to do it completely different than I've yep. done it in the past, right? Any any thoughts on that? Sometimes we need to update the operating system. <laughs> Sometimes we need to update the hardware. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. holding my phone up for those. Yeah, yeah. The audio. yeah, yeah. And, no, and, and yeah, but keep going. Yeah, I was just going to say, and and um, and for me, like you redoing the um, your your home office that you mentioned. Uh, mm-hmm. I know when when I do that, it's like I, I need to do a reset around how I'm approaching this, what I'm doing, where I'm investing my energy in this space. Is it working? Is it not working? Well, I need to just change everything. And then through that change, we're going to start to do things a little bit differently. And so I think the one degree shifts obviously are important, which is a bit of a evolution. But sometimes, like you're saying, Jim, maybe it's a big revolution of like, I'm just going to reboot and change how I do this. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's been refreshing. It's so instead of quitting, you just reboot. You're like, okay, I still have to keep doing this, (laughs) but I'm going to do it completely different than I did it before. And it's, it's a little bit freeing on that. And, and it's not a term I even, I mean, I, I only done it a few times successfully, but in in the middle of one right now, and I'm, it's incredibly freeing. I'm like, oh, I got a chance to do this completely different. (laughs) Okay. like, Like, let's get on this thing. So uh, pretty great. Muzz, anything else? Uh, is we, we've got just a few minutes left. Anything we missed or anything else that you wanted to encourage the coaching community at large with as we think about advice around this thing that we do? Here? Yeah. Um, yeah. One that jumps out straight away, Jim, uh, is living what you teach. Mm. And unfortunately, over the years, um, whether it's a coach or a, a manager, that I've worked with is working with some other people 
and helping them around strengths or a, a, another area that they support in. So for me, it might be around um, mindset or communication or providing effective feedback, whatever it might be. But unfortunately, what happens sometimes is we don't live that. And it's a, a yeah. bit like the mechanic that's got the worst running car. And so what I would say is if you are helping people, you are partnering with people, whether it's within organization or you're in coaching business, look to apply in your own life what you're helping people with. And it might not seem, uh, or might seem obvious, I should say, but honestly, it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, there's a feedback process I use at home with my wife and my children, there's a, a model around communication my wife and I use regularly. And what it does is it locks in for you as a practitioner, but also it actually is just living authentically. And I just say it's something so, so powerful. I completely agree. It's, it's tough to, like I mentioned this earlier, it's tough to take somewhere, someone, a place you haven't been before. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think we've got to continue. And, and I, I, you know, for me, living uh, living my life experience through the advice, the wisdom, the the learning of not only what what Gallup's research says, but coaches globally has made a huge impact on who I am and what I do. I was talking to some folks the other day, like, "How do you know so much about this?" I'm like, "Well, I have to listen to every single episode <laughs> of the stuff I record, right? That means I have to learn it, and it's yeah. and it has great impact on me because I'm actively engaged in the conversation and what we're doing." And so, yeah, I guess I would echo that and encourage mm. folks to not be afraid to that. This isn't something to teach. This is something to live. Yes, yes, right? I agree. Yeah, yeah so. totally agree. Um, we did have a team strengths grid on our fridge, which was for our family for many years. Nice. Yeah. Um, and, and it was great just, you know, to, to, to reference. And I'm happy to say we're beyond that now because we actually really live and breathe it. Right. Right. It, it, and it, it has its phases, I think, too, with our yeah. family. We have a Google Doc that we just share and it's got everybody's, you know, it's got everybody's themes in it. And you could go in and we don't do it all the time, but every once in a while, someone would be like, you know, I wonder what they'll hear something and they'll be like, what was that? And then, you know, they'll dig into the, <laughs> dig into the spreadsheet to see like, well, what was happening there? So I think another great tool to use with your family. For sure. there, there is a caveat here, Jim, when you can be too passionate and um, <laughs> my, my son, when he's, he's, uh, his girlfriend, you know, I think it's like the second or third time came over to our house and he's, you know, a teenager and I just walk in and say, so do you want to do your strengths? Let's find them out. <laughs> and uh, she was like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, okay, I need to explain this thing that we do here. I say you're on the same page. But it was then honestly really powerful for them to understand each other. Mm -hmm. Well, my daughter does not let anyone... Like they can't be her friend if they, she doesn't know their strengths. <laughs> like <laughs> she's given, she's begged me for code. She's given away. She's just like, yeah, I can't have friends. I don't know. I don't know what their top five are. Like that's, that's how important it is for her. I love that. And can I just say, um, Andrea has just commented in the chat using the best of me exercise with a spouse is a good exercise. I love that. It's a powerful exercise with friends, with family, um, and, and obviously with uh, organizations and teams, but it can go anywhere. Yeah. Um, one last thing I did want to mention, Jim, and that is in this um, desire and journey of creating more flow in your life, whether you're an internal coach or a coach running your business, also be easy on yourself. Mm -hmm. I think with COVID in the last few years and the challenges that we've all had in different ways, and just like uh, we often think about the people we're serving and working with, but also let's be easy on ourselves because there's been lots of challenges. And when we don't get that exactly right, that's okay. And when you're not in that flow state or you're out, that's okay. And learn from that. Um, but also just be easy on yourself and be kind to yourself as you go along. And I think that's been something that uh, has been really, really helpful for me. Good. And easily said, harder to do, but even that requires some grace to your, yeah. back to yourself, right? Yeah. On that. 
Yeah. So Murray, thank you for spending the time with me today. It always goes super fast. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Uh, last year was that, or the year before something, something along those lines. COVID makes messes up with times. Uh, it could have really, been six I, years ago. Who knows? It, it really could have <laughs> been, but uh, always great to spend time with you. Some great encouragement that's going to come in from the chat room as we kind of wrap this up. But if folks want to get in touch with you, if they got any questions, they want to get in touch with you. What's the, what's the best way to do that? Oh, the easiest way is just connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message. So Murray Guest, G-U-E-S-T, um, but also check out my website, inspiremybusiness.com, and you can send me a message there. So either is great. And Jim, as always, it's been wonderful to connect with you. Um, I was in flow. That hour has gone so quick. <laughs> It does. And um, it does. thank you again. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I want to acknowledge all the comments and the interaction in the chat today. I've been seeing all those come up. It's been fantastic. Really appreciate it's, it. It's always nice. I don't do this often enough, but to bring these in at the end of the conversation as people are thanking the guests that are coming in and, and, the, and for things that are said. So we appreciate you guys. You can continue with that recognition out there in chat because we keep it all. But uh um, uh, Murray, thanks for coming out. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we do have available around this, um, on, uh, <laughs> Mark will love that statement that I just made. He's my editor, uh, around this at gallup.com slash Clifton strengths for coaching master coaching. If you want to become a Gallup certified strengths coach, you can send us an email coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to stay up to date with all the webcasts that are coming out. A couple series is coming up, uh, that are starting in November, the season two of, um, the Clifton Strengths podcast as we look at leadership, authentic leadership. Uh, we're going to spend some time. Uh, to, uh, it seems like a timely topic with what we talked about today. And so um, that'll be happening soon. Go out to gallop.eventbrite.com. Follow us there and you'll get an email whenever I schedule a new event like this one. And we think the hundreds that registered for this one um, as well, a great way to stay up to date. You can join us in the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash called to coach. And I'm always amazed how many people make it I say that and people always say, no, if you say the web address, they'll never make it there and everybody makes it there. So facebook.com slash groups slash called to coach. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Uh, we will uh, see you on the next one. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.